also known as SHEO. We serve the chief executives of statewide governing, policy, and coordinating boards of post-secondary education and their staffs. On behalf of Noah Brown, President and CEO of the Association of Community College Trustees, and Matt Gandel, President and CEO of the Education Strategy Group, I want to welcome you to our Making a Comeback webinar series. Our three organizations are acutely aware of the tremendous stress that our higher education systems and institutions are under due to the effects of the COVID pandemic, especially as the health and safety challenges are compounded by the severe effects of the economic downturn. We're offering this webinar series to equip leaders around the country with strategies for positioning post-secondary education as an engine to accelerate the recovery. Our previous webinars focused on planning for a changing labor market in light of COVID-19, addressing the urgent leaks in the pipeline from K through 12, as well as contingency plans for fall reopenings. These webinars are posted on the ESG website if you want to view them at some point in the future. Today's topic is reskilling displaced workers. Given the likelihood that many displaced workers will enroll in education and training, it is incumbent upon higher education to prioritize innovative delivery models and to ensure that individuals can successfully and quickly attain the skills they need for immediate job placement. Our panel today consists of three different leaders from three very different structures. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists, if I may. First, we have Alex Johnson. Alex is president of Cuyahoga Community College, and Zora Mulligan is with us. She's the commissioner of higher education for the Missouri Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development. And also Catherine Weedle, who is strategy officer for finance and federal policy at the Lumina Foundation. Thank you all three for your willingness to join us and to share your insights today. Greatly appreciated. Before we start, just brief housekeeping. We're going to have a discussion with the panelists that's going to last approximately 35 minutes or so on the topic of the webinar. Then we'll turn to questions that are posed by the audience. The chat feature will be shut off for participants, but please use the Q&A tab on the toolbar to submit your questions. Because we have a very large group, we might not be able to get to all of, of your questions, and we apologize for that fact, but we'll do the best that we can. For best viewing, please set your options to gallery view um, if it is not already set there. And the webinar will also be recorded and a link will be provided to all participants. So please uh, take advantage of that moving forward, share with some of your colleagues. And also you can follow along on Twitter using the making a comeback hashtag. So with that, we will go ahead and get started. So first I wanna start with a, a general question to um, all of our panelists today. Um, with over 42 million American workers unemployed and many facing an urgent need for skills for reemployment, there's a tremendous need for post-secondary systems and institutions to provide immediate education and training opportunities that are aligned with available jobs. Yet even before COVID-19, higher education leaders were already talking about the need to upskill adults, um, given today's fast pace and dynamic workforce, with much of this emphasis really focused on non-degree credentials. A work by our partner ESG, along with uh, the National Skills Coalition, has highlighted approaches to defining non-degree credentials, uh, providing resources for those programs, expanding work-based learning models, and supporting stackable credentials. And so you, the panelists, I'd, I'd love to hear from you, what are some concrete examples of efforts that you're putting into place this fall to reskill displaced workers, and also your views on non-degree credentials and how can we assure that they are of quality and aligned with good jobs. So with that, to start us off, Alex, if we could start with you, that'd be wonderful. I started talking, Rob, and I forgot to unmute myself. As many of these I have on a daily basis, it seems that I should have this down pat by now, but unfortunately uh, not. Uh, but I think what you've done, quite honestly, is really frame our conversation in a very distinct uh, and important way. 
Uh, first of all, you started off by describing the number, the tremendous number of Americans that are unemployed as a result of COVID. You talked about the importance of reskilling and providing individuals unemployed now with the tools that they need in order to take advantage of the workforce following uh, COVID-19. And you also talked a little bit about the important responsibilities that institutions have to develop programs that address those needs, most notably short term. And quite honestly, that represents exactly how individuals are feeling about, the, about uh, what they need in order to uh, be better off both economically and personally. What we have not really talked about to any extent is the anxiety and apprehension that individuals continue to feel so much so that 11% of Americans have delayed, for example, their educational plan. So before we even think about uh, bringing them to, educa uh, to educational uh, institutions and organizations, we need to help them understand exactly what the benefits are to this education and training. First of all, they can develop their skills more fully to take advantage of jobs in these growing uh, sectors, most notably information technology, finance, and business, and to an extent, uh, health careers. The other thing that's important is that institutions and organizations work side by side to get that done in collaboration uh, with business. Business is really, really going to be important as we try to ferret out exactly what the future is going to look like because their efforts will be significant as we think about the competencies that will be required uh, from, for individuals as opposed to degrees. Number one, what number two, what type of compensation uh, might be uh, appropriate for individuals returning? What type of culture will exist uh, following uh, COVID-19 and how do we develop that more fully to ensure that individuals uh, can be successful in those environments? And then I think organizations too have to understand that they have a role and responsibility for directing educational institutions so that they more fully understand exactly what needs to be, uh, be offered. And all of us will have to be able to accommodate urgently and readily change uh, because we still are uncertain about what COVID-19 uh, will bring uh, in the future. Uh, but I think it's important for organizations and institutions to understand that first, then think about the types of programs that would be that would be necessary. Thank you for that, Alex. Greatly appreciated. Zor, how about in um, Missouri? What uh, what are you guys currently doing to help with this uh, reskilling of displaced workers, and how do you contextualize or kind of view these non-degree credentials? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say we kind of have three main approaches in Missouri, and each is targeted uh, to different but overlapping audiences. In terms of you know people who found themselves found themselves on unemployment, we have a campaign going called Return Strong, which is basically a reverse call center where we reach out to people who've um, worked with us to file unemployment insurance claims because we do have the ability to do that. Um, we reach out to them with information about what um, job training programs are available and, and basically what we can pay for. Uh, it's an ongoing conversation and it's been really beneficial. We've had a very strong interest in this as people start to recognize that their unemployment insurance benefits are not gonna last forever. Um, we have also partnered closely with um, financial aid officers to cross train them on uh, federal job training funds and as they relate to state financial aid programs, so that's been beneficial. The second thing that we've been doing uh, is a campaign called Motivate Missouri, and it's really focused on more of the quote unquote traditional um, college age student, and it encourages them you know, to stay on the post-secondary path, even if it looks different than their original plans did but emphasizing um, that there are still good options available to every different kind of student. And that includes um, what we call Five to Thrive, which is um, apprenticeships and work-based learning, certificate programs, associate degrees, bachelor's, graduate, and professional. Um, so, and then the last thing we're doing is working with um, institutions in the governor's office to make sure that um, our public colleges and universities have the financial resources they need to reopen safely and flexibly in the fall. In terms of my view of non-degree uh, credentials, I don't have super popular opinions in some circles. I think they're really important. Um, I think in a perfect world, they would connect you know, very neatly to a credit lattice you know, that a student can take with them as they progress through their life and work. 
but we live in this world. Um, a, an old friend of mine in community college world said something that's resonated forever with me, which is sometimes you've got to make a living before you can make a life. And non-credit credentials are often a very important part of that um, advancement that the people need. Um, the last thing I would say on non-credit credentials is that um, I view our role as a coordinating board as having an important um, part in informing people about the outcomes of those programs. So years ago, using TAC grant funds, we were able to build um, a data system that provides um, individuals with information about the outcome of programs, including non-credit. So uh, we're working like crazy every day, and I could, could talk for an hour, but I'm inter interested in hearing what others have to say. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Zor. I appreciate that. Catherine, with your work um, at a foundation and, and working with a myriad of states on this front, I'd be very curious to get uh, you, your perspective on what you're seeing out in the field. Sure, and thank you for having me again to ESG and to SHIO being a great partner, not only in this webinar, but in the adult promise work overall. So generally, Adult Promise is first and foremost a finance strategy so that it um, can support uh, adult learners who are returning or going to uh, post-secondary education for the first time. And so with that, we want the goal of Adult Promise was to make affordability uh, a center for not just traditionally age students, but what does that mean? for adults to reskill, retool, or tooling for the first time. It started with five states, Indiana, Maine, Minnesota, Oklahoma, and Washington, and has uh, expanded to 15 that, to include Arizona, California, Hawaii, uh, Idaho, Kentucky, North Carolina, Oregon, Ohio, Rhode Island, and Texas. I am impressed by myself that I was able to do that. <laughs> um, and, and with that, there are a variety of different strategies, a variety of different contexts when we talk about a decentralized state versus a centralized system. Um, what the capacity of the uh, agency itself has in order to align and realign. Uh, what does the state legislator, le legislature think about uh, fi financing adult education? And I'm sure we'll get to talk about that a little bit more of the, the position that institutions and states are in right now considering the public health crisis. The other thing that I wanted to make sure that I elevated, uh, especially because our uh, VP, Dr. Courtney Brown, just finished up or might still be on a webinar about uh, short-term credentials um, and other um, in industry certifications. I want to emphasize a couple of resources that first, um, we have our quality and equity um, report and work um, called Unlocking the Nation's Potential. Um, our position is not that uh, certifications, certificates, and other non-degree or non-credential or non-credit bearing um, credentials um, should just be out in the market. We want to make sure that those are quality credentials that lead to further education or lead to some return in the market. Um, and again, recognizing that there are so many different market forces when it comes to race and ethnicity that we can talk about. Uh, but first and foremost, we, we identify that as what quality is and quality should not be a sacrifice for um, the credential sake. And, and thinking about Dr. Courtney Brown um, and her work with Stronger Nation, the foundation now has data to count uh, certificates and certifications in that work. And so if you're not familiar with Stronger Nation, I strongly suggest that you take a look at the tool. You can uh, use that tool to look at nationally, state level, and now countywide, what uh, attainment looks like um, and also by race. Uh, I have colleagues across the foundation that are working on how do we restructure our higher ed infrastructure to make that easier for the student, um, as well as folks who are focused on the future of work and explicitly what industry certifications and non-degree credentials are actually leading to higher returns for um, low-income folks and people of color. I, I really appreciate that, Catherine, and I, I appreciate the different aspects that all three brought up in your answers, Alex, in, in, in talking about this context and what this new world that we're entering and make sure that our campuses 
are prepared and, and, and ready to address this myriad of needs and the hesitancy of some of our students, frankly, to come engage. Generally, during a recession, we see um, a disproportionate gain, particularly in community colleges. And, and I think we're almost at a wait and see attitude right now because we know of some of the challenges that lie ahead and we have to be prepared to face them. And, and Zora, and, and talking about the, the latticing of some of these uh, credentials and skill sets and how this needs to come together, so important. And then Catherine, with you layering on top of that, the whole issue of quality, that the fact that in facing this brave new world and where we need to go quickly to respond to workforce needs, we can't sacrifice quality. Um, with what's being um, invested into these systems, what students and their families are paying, we have to be able to assure that there are gonna be some workforce payoffs um, moving forward and down the road, that's also important. And a, another key issue that we, that we know is looming over this discussion is, is, is that of equity. Um, our states overall, they have significant and persistent equity gaps in, as far as um, outcomes for, for different uh, subsets of our student populations uh, with those underrepresented students not finishing, not completing at as high of a rate as white students. Um, Strata Education has also been conducting weekly polls on the impact of COVID-19 on, on work and education. And a recent poll and recent polling has shown that, that, um, that students of color are disproportionately being impacted uh, by this pandemic. Uh, the latest findings from Strata details how Americans of color are more likely to have lost jobs, to worry that they will lose their jobs, and to have canceled or changed education or training because of the pandemic. 35% of black respondents and 39% of Hispanic respondents believe that if they lost their job, they would need more education in order to replace it. And so the question to, to each of you again is, what steps are you taking to ensure that already vulnerable student populations aren't further disadvantaged as a result of these new realities? So Alex, let's start with you again. I, I actually need an unmuter. I mean, if that's the, a new job category uh, for many of us who are um, uh, engaged in these teleconferences on a regular basis, I will tell you, Rob, that what you described uh, with respect to uh, the, um, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on economically disadvantaged and students of color is not new. Uh, the issues are around, about, around access to education and outcomes has been uh, something that we've been challenged by for a very, very long time. Unfortunately, the COVID uh, panic, uh, uh, pandemic has only heightened, a con uh, heightened this concern. So when I look at my institution and others, while there have been some stabilization and leveling of enrollments, uh, generally uh, economically disadvantaged uh, and students of color are not returning in the numbers that, uh, that, uh, that others are. And so we need to make certain that we figure out ways that individuals continue to have access to education first and foremost. I think the other thing that's important is that we provide the financial support uh, that they need to be successful. And that ultimately we provide wraparound services that offset some of the insecurities that they experience on a daily basis. At my institution, we've been doing that for a very, very long time. Uh, we have special scholarship programs set aside for Hispanic students uh, and black students. We do have um, specialized programs and services for those students, including our Hispanic Council and our Black American Council, whose responsibility it is uh, to not only provide mentoring and educational support, but to help these students affirm their cultural values while they're here at the institution. And we've gone as far as creating access centers uh, in some of the most depressed areas of Cleveland, and they have shown to be beneficial in meeting individuals uh, where they are. As institutions of higher education and community colleges specifically, we have a responsibility to promote the overall well-being of the communities that we serve. Uh, not only do we provide 
these significant educational experiences, but we also have to tackle some of the social uh, factors that affect student, uh, that affect individuals and provide uh, a way for them to deal uh, with those uh, as well. So this is nothing new. Uh, and if we recognize that this is going to be uh, heightened as a result of COVID-19, we need to do something about it. Now, I must indicate to you uh, that there has been a, a wellspring of support uh, since the um, uh, murder of George Floyd. And I think the community at large is seeing their responsibility in a different way, but we've got to be more consistent in terms of how uh, we respond. Thanks for that, Alex. We really appreciate it. Uh, Zor, the same to you. What, what's taking place in Missouri to help uh, protect some of these vulnerable student populations? Yeah, absolutely. So a um, couple of things. I mean, one, we do have a big goal that we measure our progress toward every year. Missouri has seen slow but steady uh, growth and attainment for all categories, and particularly African-American students. And so while we still have a lot of work to do, a lot of the strategies that we've worked with local institutions to implement over the years are having positive impacts. Um, you know, when we think about uh, our role at the coordinating board, um, funding is a major part of, of what we do. And so in our advocacy with the governor's office, uh, there is going to be a significant amount of money set aside um, for, for uh, services, including student support services, because we know they're going to be essential for all students as they return to campus in the fall, and particularly for our most vulnerable populations. Uh, we're also working with our Department of Social Services to place social workers on campuses. A few of our schools currently have uh, social workers in place, but we'll be increasing that pretty dramatically. Um, we're also partnering with the Department of Mental Health to offer mental health uh, training remotely to people who are going to be working with students as well as to our staff and job centers uh, to help with just some basic uh, mental health first aid because we know that that's going to be a really critical issue in the fall and beyond. It was a critical issue before and it will only be exacerbated now. You know, when I, I think about this current um, crisis that we face in terms of the economy, um, it's, it has caused us to rethink our, our equity strategies in both workforce and in higher education because the numbers affected by uh, this crisis um, are, are different than they have been historically. They don't follow traditional trend lines. And so in Missouri, you know, suddenly we have many, many more women out of work than men, and that's very unusual. Um, in our Adult Promise program, we actually have very intentionally marketed many programs specifically to men. Um, because we do have educational attainment rate issues in terms of, of lower class men in particular. Um, and so now, you know, with this news about women, we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, estimating what percent of those are likely to return to work fairly quickly, how many of them are healthcare workers, but it's definitely making us rethink strategy. Um, another trend uh, in Missouri, as in many states, is that many more Hispanic individuals have been affected by unemployment or reductions in hours. And so thinking again specifically about how do we net work with uh, the networks that we're connected with um, through our work, um, both in workforce development and also in equity, to deliver messages to the populations who need it the most about the resources that we're making available. Um, and then I think the last thing I would say is, um, you know, really focusing on outcomes. So, you know, because we do include um, job centers that help people who are unemployed, you know, working with individual job centers um, based on the clients they serve to help them understand, you know, the outcomes of what happens when someone visits a job center. Are they more likely to get training? Are they more likely to be employed? There's a lot of difference around the state. And so really working with those local teams to coach them on how to improve outcomes for the citizens that they serve. Thank you, Zor. Appreciate that. And, and Catherine, the same to you. How, how does uh, Lumina Foundation contextualize this issue? Yeah, I'm going to do my best to be brief. Um, but I have uh, three things in mind. So thinking about uh, the historical moment that we're situated in, um, as well as the role of violence, and then some uh, explicit lessons learned from the adult promise states. So um, if folks don't know me in, in outside of my grant making uh, role, um, my research focus is as a historian and I study the history of race and racism in higher education policy. Um, and providing critique for the policies that we largely think about expanding access to higher education. Um, one of those things that we talk about in Herald is the Servicemen Act of 1944, also known as the GI Bill, um, and what that did for the entire system of higher education uh, and largely the education benefits that um, veterans had access to. 
but it largely uh, failed black veterans. Uh, and that's partially because of uh, segregation and explicit race and racism um, and how it was implemented. It, uh, uh, black veterans themselves missed out on the use of the education benefit because they only could attend HBCUs. Um, and at the same time, states that were largely um, putting dollars into historically white institutions to build up their uh, institutional capacity to do housing and all the things that we talk about today um, were not available and that those dollars didn't flood into historically black colleges and universities. So we missed out on uh, putting into the individual and putting into the institution that helps the community. And I think about that right now um, when we're in that this moment of high unemployment, we don't know when it will recover. We're using words like recession when the, the likelihood we may slip into depression. And what does that really look like for um, communities of color and explicitly low income communities of color? How we respond now is how 20, 30 years from now, historians will judge us in this moment. Um, I think Adult Promise has been able to uh, seed different ideas and put some infrastructure in place in 15 states. But I do want to say that we had interest from 25 states. And I assume that most states are thinking about reskilling workers as part of their full economic recovery um, plan. So I'm hoping that uh, as state budgets are being considered and proposals are being put out, um, that there is a, a conscious thinking about how equity play, uh, plays out in policy writing and policy implementation. We didn't talk about violence, but though I'm grateful um, that uh, Alex has mentioned the murder of George Floyd. And um, when that happened a few weeks ago, of course, managing your own personal emotional uh, responses. Thinking about my work, I thought about our state leads in Minnesota. And what does, what does this look like? in Minnesota for a state agency or someone from the state to then reach out to black adults and say, we want you to come into our institutions. Are our institutions safe for people of color? It's not just finance, it's not just uh, housing and transportation, but if uh, I think about my, my own generation millennials who are 40 years old this year, um, if we want to re-enroll those folks or who have experienced racial violence, um, where can they go in the state? And I think it, it, it begs institutional leaders to have honest conversations about where can we do better um, socially, economically for students of color. Do, do the, does the community see your institution as a partner, as an adversary or indifference? And there's pros and cons um, across the board. Some explicit things, um, Zora mentioned outcomes. I tend to nudge people and say, you cannot address structural racism by avoiding the problem, by good intentions, don't come outcomes. Um, and through individual solutions, we have to think structurally. I'm grateful to the partnership with Mathematica, who is our evaluative partner. Um, and they have a, a great memo for folks, um, another resource, that's called Why Equity Matters for Adult College Completion. Just a few strategies that have come out of the state uh, leads, the state projects. First, explicitly focusing in on equity. Um, again, your intentions do not equal outcomes. So how can you do your own equity audit of every step in the process? How can a decision uh, impact the increase or decrease of in, uh, participation of people of color. And that might look different across different communities, which means that you have to set your goals and identify your own target populations. Uh, you wanna build equity into your outreach. So Oregon, Hawaii, so many of our states um, engage students who left the institution or institutions to investigate why and having focus groups, because those things are important and should be reflected in your outreach. Um, 
some cool things that have come out of the Adult Promise States uh, in Kentucky. They've reached out to the rap duo Nappy, Nappy Roots to do their jingle because folks know who Nappy Roots are in the community. Um, so are there any local celebrities or folks who are um, connected to that community that can say, hey, there's this bright light beacon of opportunity that folks should consider. And it's also nested in a safe place with a quality credential that's gonna have some outcomes, right? Um, again, thinking about message testing. So California did message testing with folks of color in their, their target populations. Um, I also want to do a shout out to not forget your local foundations and your community foundations. I think folks tend to look at the national funders like Illumina or Kresge to be able to support work, but you do have local foundations that whose dollars you can leverage with both the state commitment um, and uh, other uh, dollars available uh, for the full cost of tuition. So thinking about the transportation and the childcare issues that can come out. And don't forget your local partnerships with nonprofits who do direct service or just have inroads into communities. I often encourage folks to reach out to their affiliate chapters of NAACP, the National Urban League, um, some uh, National Panhellenic Council alumni and alumni chapters who are all committed to and have some semblance of uh, knowing higher education is important um, and is an important tool um, and also has uh, in roles to people of color. That's just a few things. I also want to uh, elevate uh, the Joyce Center for Political and Economic Studies. Uh, tomorrow, the Bureau of Labor Statistics will release its June employment report, and um, that report will also have uh, some more information about what employment claims data looks like for Black, Latino, and Native people. Get into that for your own state and protect uh, your own locales to figure out who is in most need and how can you leverage the resources that you have available. Thanks for that. Kevin. <laughs> that was uh, very, very illuminating um, and greatly appreciated. Um, you, you got at the heart of some of this that, the, that these uh, equity gaps are structural in, in nature. There's uh, structural barriers or structural racism that you can trace back into, into our history and, and how this developed and we have to challenge ourselves and others to develop policy that will address them. And I, I, I agree that this needs internal audits and, and we're about to do that at SHEO, frankly. Uh, we're gonna work with Sean Harper and his team in Southern California to come in and, and help us take a close look at ourselves and what we can do better and how we can better eradicate some of these barriers that, 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 uh, that, that draw back uh, parts of our population uh, perhaps unintentionally, but, but, the, but the reality and the gaps are still very real. So um, the, thanks for that. Um, just a reminder, if, you, if, the, if the conversation is, is jogging any questions that you have or anything you wanna follow up on with any of our panelists, please put that in the Q&A. And, and I would like to ask uh, each panelist an individual question at this point, but, but at that point, we would like to get to some of your questions that you have. So, so as this conversation is, is drawing forth us, some of those questions, please make sure to enter them and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So, so Alex, um, back to you, sir. As, as president of Ohio's largest and oldest community college, serving more than 50,000 students annually, how do you go, I mean, what does it look like for you to engage your local community to better understand these needs of local business um, and workers in you know, what's gonna be this post-COVID reality quite soon. Uh, well, what steps are you taking to, to, to address some of this connectivity that's needed there? Thank you very much, Rob, uh, for the question. And I think I've uh, pretty much answered uh, some of it, but to give you some specific examples, um, a lot of us here at the institution, most notably myself, Working, working very closely with uh, foundations, economic development groups, and other entities designed to really uh, help businesses understand exactly uh, how to go about uh, developing their workforce uh, more fully. Uh, for example, uh, we head up uh, in our county 
uh, what we call a healthcare workforce intermediary. And what that intermediary is designed to do is bring together uh, educators, um, funders, um, employers, and others uh, to talk about exactly where the job opportunities are, uh, the type of training that will be necessary, and then ultimately, how do we ensure that individuals from different backgrounds can take advantage of them? Uh, we're involved in a lot of what we call um, uh, COVID-related uh, um, activities, all designed to look at where we are and where we need to be following uh, the, um, uh, the end of the, the, the pandemic uh, particularly with respect to getting people employed and in jobs. Uh, we also are working very, very closely, and we did this before the pandemic, uh, with about 300 uh, companies in our community. A lot of them are engaged in what we call earn and learn opportunities for individuals, or they are involved with um, uh, providing internships and things of that sort designed to get people uh, in the jobs and get them uh, paid. Apprenticeships is an area where we have invested a lot of time and energy. Uh, as you know, the Department of Labor has uh, implemented a program nationwide that's designed to train thousands of individuals uh, through apprenticeship programs, and we are involved in those. Uh, we're involved in those as well. Uh, within our Workforce Community and Economic Development Division, we have what we call a Board of Visitors. And that Board of Visitors is really a high-level group of individuals who are either CEOs or in the CEO suite. And their responsibility is to provide advice and counsel on uh, the direction that we need to take as an institution to ensure that our programs and services reflect uh, the needs of the community at large. And then, of course, um, we work very, very closely uh, with uh, philanthropy, for example, a fund for the economic future, um, the Cleveland Foundation, for example, and the Gunn Foundation, they're all laser uh, focused in a laser-like fashion on workforce development, most notably around ensuring uh, that individuals from vulnerable communities get what they need uh, to be successful. There's a lot that we're doing um, and I can go on to uh, describe many, many more, but that's generally uh, what, we're, what we're doing right now. The other thing that I really want to emphasize, and this is critically important, is that in the future, we need to tailor programs uh, to attract more individuals across diverse backgrounds and experiences. In our state, we have the Adult Diploma Program, and that di Adult Diploma Program uh, will provide an individual training and as a result of that training, they automatically get a high school diploma, not a GED, but an actual high school diploma. Right now, that is linked peripherally uh, to our programs and services here at the institution because of a shortfall in funding at the state level. But we've got to do more of that, those types of programs that focus specifically on the technical aspects of the training and all of the educational and academic stuff can be embedded in those. So. Thanks for that uh, comprehensive response, Alex. And I, I, I agree with that in working in those technical aspects. You're just your wealth of experience and, and, and being at your institution, uh, you know, building these partnerships, to developing this, it doesn't happen uh, overnight. There has to be trust and there has to be competency and expertise on both ends. And I, I really appreciate you sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Zora, to you next. Um, in 2018, you co-led Missouri's Talent for Tomorrow project, uh, an initiative that built a, a statewide coalition of corporate executives, educators, community leaders, government officials uh, to develop and advocate for this comprehensive suite uh, of proposals to address s some of your state workforce needs. Um, how has this work influenced the state's ability to address some of your current needs to reskill its workforce? Sure, so the results of Talent for Tomorrow had many, many components, but the two um, that are probably most of interest to the folks on this call are one, a reorganization of state government, the biggest reorganization of state government that's happened since 1973. 
Um, our department, which previously had been the Department of Higher Education, is now the Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development, which means that we um, administer the WIOA programs as well as several other workforce-related programs. Um, a kind of undersung part of this transition is that we also inherited the state's uh, Economic Research Information Center, which brought into our team about 25 really excellent researchers who've expanded our capacity significantly in terms of research. Um, so that was a big one. And then the additional was um, uh, the creation of an adult promise program that we've been working like crazy people to get up and off the ground. Uh, the new department is really organized around, um, you know, the idea that we needed to have one organization in state government that's responsible for all of the education options that a person encounters after they graduate from high school. Um, again, I mentioned, you know, the five things we focus on, including apprenticeships, uh, you know, certificates, associate bachelor's, graduate and professional. Um, and so, you know, we've got a board where we've got, you know, each of our target populations, including those who have historically lower attainment rates, and our programs lined up against those populations and really asking ourselves, how are we doing uh, in these categories? Um, you know, we too have put a tremendous emphasis on apprenticeships as a state, and in, in many ways we're leading uh, uh, in some key national numbers. But if you look at participation by race, you see we've got a big gap to close. And so, you know, traditionally our apprenticeship team has really been focused on, on adding industries to our apprenticeship um, option menu. We've really shifted our focus instead to think about uh, people, the people that we serve. Um, so, you know, focused on that, um, you know, raising people's awareness of the options, um, making them, you know, getting them on a path to success, which is largely about financial resources and other kinds of, of resources, um, increasing quality attainment. And so if you think of it as a funnel, um, you know, raising awareness, increasing success, increasing attainment, um, and then really using data and performance to drive outcomes has been, um, you know, tremendous for us. I appreciated what Catherine said about data. Um, you know, I, I have often observed that education is an industry populated by true believers, and as such, we're very tempted to make faith-based decisions. And that ain't gonna cut it. Just because you feel like it's working does not necessarily mean that it is, in fact, working. Um, and, you know, especially at the state level, it's really hard to know. It's not like, you know, you just turn the crank here and then increase the pressure here, and all of a sudden, you know, out comes a, a whole bunch, you know, better results. And so it's, for us, this has really been a year of experimentation. And then the last of our focuses um, is making our department the best place to work. We've got a, a good set of strategies around that. What I would say, you know, in terms of how this has impacted our ability to rise to the challenge of this moment, I'll just take a second to tell you about the things that have happened to me since I became commissioner. Uh, the governor who hired me, the governor who appointed the board that hired me resigned. We had a new governor, uh, I'm sorry, it turned out we had a new governor who left under a cloud of scandal. Uh, do not Google governor sex scandal and duct tape on your work computer. Oh, add hairdresser. That'll get you to the result we're looking for. We've got a new governor. We've got this whole new deal. So it's been just a completely bananas thing. You know, like a whole new department as of August 28th. And now here we are um, with the COVID crisis. You know, I, I will say in many ways, having all of this change has uh, strengthened us as an organization. And then the main outcomes of all that came out of Talent for Tomorrow are really about credibility. Um, community and capacity. So we're viewed as a much more credible voice in both the education and the workforce space. Um, we've built a community of people who are committed to workforce development and to equity, and there's a lot of overlap in those groups. All of those chambers of, of commerce that came along with us on the workforce conversation have hung in with us on the equity conversation, and it's been really, really positive. Uh, and then last capacity. I mean, we're just a bigger and better organization than we used to be, and it's, um, it's making a real difference. Yeah, it, it's fascinating to see the structural changes that have taken place in Missouri. And, you know, as, as one who's watching closely week in and week out, I, I've been able to see some of that synergy and some of those efficiencies you guys have developed. And it's, it's going to be exciting to see how, how you can leverage that moving forward. As you uh, noted, the, the, the crisis or the um, particular viewpoints of who's in charge might, might change. They, they might uh, alter from, from year to year. Sometimes it seems week to week. But I, I think you guys have a structure in place that'll allow you to pivot where you need to and be able to address these challenges. So that's really cool. God, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Catherine, the question I have for you, I'm, I'm, it's going to be somewhat uh, merged with an, an audience question, but getting at policies that hinder equity, which you discussed, um, whether in enrollment and completion, um, what have you seen in states in the Adult Promise Program what do they um, do to support some of what is needed structurally 
to um, address some of these challenges that exist, such as those who have exhausted Pell are no longer uh, qualified due to SAP? Mm -hmm. Right, that's a great question. So I may not be able to get as a, down to the, the last part of that question, but again, I'll say that Adult Promise was first envisioned as a finance play um, to make a degree granting or not degree granting, uh, uh, receiving more affordable. Um, and I say degree, but also credentials as well. Um, I am so concerned about the higher ed market and competition right now, what, how it might place uh, community colleges, uh, regional publics, um, minority serving institutions, institutions that largely serve students of color and um, have been in the business of serving adult learners forever. Um, and what it means now for institutions that and boards and, and leaders that are weighing their options about what enrollment might look like, not just next into the fall, but the spring and the summer thereafter. Um, so, and, and it's exactly at the time where state uh, legislators are proposing major cuts. So a couple of things that I can put together from adult promise and from what's happening right now. Um, now is not the time to let up on equity. If anything, it is even more of a time to keep hollering, screaming, waving that red flag. Um, because what, again, what we do now and what ends up being successful at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, will have huge implications over the next 10 years. It's not just a year. Um, and so we'll see if states are really committing to uh, uh, utilizing uh, credentials and adult uh, attainment programs already in the works and scaling that up across states. Um, rather than taking more funds away. So at least if I can say to folks who are working with state legislatures or state budgets um, that if you're going to be cutting from education programs to think about doing so equitably, that it's not a good time to, to slash budgets for um, the, the institutions that you're gonna need most in order to reskill um, folks. Um, at the federal level, uh, of course, conversations about short-term Pell and paying for non-degree credentials are going to ramp up. And so keeping in mind what um, uh, proposals and things may come out of that and how it will impact your students and institutions as well. Um, also mentioned WIOA, I am concerned also about uh, how uh, students of color are going to be using uh, student loans. Um, we already know that um, black students are, uh, student loan debt is extremely high in comparison to other uh, racial categories and their peers, what the, the levels of default looks like uh, for students who attain a degree versus those who do not complete. Um, and that fundamentally people of color um, and communities of color do believe in higher ed as a great equalizer and invest in their, uh, their educations because they believe in a return. Um, but we got to make sure that that there's a return and it doesn't uh, exacerbate wealth gaps. At the institutional level, um, we've seen more conversations about how might forgiveness um, support uh, completion and how does small debts like unpaid fees and unpaid tuition serve as a barrier to re-enrollment and completion. Is that hold on the account really worth that student not completing um, and thinking about the hold on the account. What are transfer articulation agreements? I think part of this work is institutions across states playing nicely with one another in both in the market and enrollment and re-enrollment, which our outreach looks like, as well as our who gets the win, who gets the completion number um, if a student has begun at one institution and have moved to another. Um, how can we hone in on that student. Uh, the GAO 2018 or 2019 released a report, a report about uh, credit transfers and 94% of credits earned at a 
for-profit institution do not get transferred? What is that going to look like for, again, students of color who are more and more enrolling in for-profit institutions? Um, does your board know anything about equity? <laughs> That's really, really important for the board to understand that, uh, and I think about community colleges, the role of the community college in that community, not just for the, uh, the revenue sake, but what, how is that institution pouring back into the community and thereby society? So a couple of really technical nerdy things for those who might be in registrar or uh, on a campus. So you want to think about what do your data systems look like and um, identifying potential completers. Um, you want to target your populations, what credits are available, and then what credits go towards. So degree auditing, um, as well as what student engagement in this process looks like, and that will impact your outreach. I think about Washington State's complete overhaul, uh, as well as their college and career compass app um, that they're gearing towards folks who may have lost their jobs or been furloughed um, so that they know what resources are available and that tool is actually useful. The tool that you create, is it useful? <laughs> is it something that a student would want to use? Um, as well as awarding that credential and again, uh, folks having hard conversations about what credentials are helpful versus those credentials that can be quickly awarded. Right. Uh, just add one thing quickly, and that's if there are registrars on the phone, um, if, if there's any conversation in your state or community about forgiveness programs to forgive those outstanding balances, um, we have one in Missouri that's fairly new, but it's not that expensive. And so I think often, you know, the hand wringing is about the cost. Uh, talk to your local foundation, talk to a state or your local community foundation, talk to a state foundation. It has not cost that much money. Yeah, yeah I'll say that. Sorry, I'll say that it, it the work that I've outlined is doesn't cost money. It costs time. Yeah. And you have to really think about the return on what that looks like in building capacity for staff in order to do this work. Can I, can I echo uh, something here that uh, is, uh, is a great thread that, uh, that you, Catherine, uh, Catherine started and um, uh, supported by Zora? It is sometimes we create barriers in our own institutions that make it impossible uh, for students of color and those economically disadvantaged not only to access our institution, not only to complete our institutions, but to access our institutions. So I think what we have to do is take a look at access as a kind of journey for students. So it's about connecting, converting them, bringing them into the institution in a seamless fashion, providing them with the learning they need to be successful, working to retain them, and of course, uh, 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 graduating them. So when you talk about degree audits and when you talk about uh, technology that undergirds the student experience, when you talk about career mapping, when you talk about pathways, those are the kinds of things that robust institutions, regardless of what level, need to do to not only support overall students, but more specifically students of color. And I would uh, certainly echo the points that you made, Karen, uh, I mean, Catherine, and the point that you made, Zora, as well. No, yeah, all that, all that's very helpful, and I really appreciate each of you uh, drawing out the nuances from your own context around that. Z something you've all mentioned, and, and we're hearing from the audience as, as I look at some of the uh, questions in chat. Uh, you know, gets at budgets. Ultimately. As Zora, you had mentioned, talk to foundations. We, some of this can be done for a little amount of money, and we know we're dealing with a context where state and local budgets are declining and are going to continue to do so for the immediate. Uh, future moving forward and we face these weird things when we have recessions to where it generally draws people back into education because they need to retool and retrain. Um, often we have to constrict campus budgets because of what's going on but with the pandemic going on now we're being challenged to expand in some unique ways um, because of distance education because of uh, social distancing and some of these other challenges we have. So but being in this environment of, of not being able to depend on local and state resources, um, 
arguing fiercely right now for another round of federal uh, f f funding that will help higher education. And I'd, I'm optimistic. I'm an optimist by nature that, that something is going to come, but we're still going to have these gaps. And what are some other funding opportunities that exist out there or some opportunities to get the resources that we might need to do the things that we know we're going to have to do? One, to support all of our students, but particularly those who are underrepresented within our institutions. Uh, have at it. That's for anybody <laughs> who might answer. <laughs> well, let me start because I know um, uh, Catherine and, and Zora have much better answers uh, than I do, but what has been a saving grace uh, for my institution is looking at uh, equity as not just a peripheral kind of responsibility that we have, uh, but it is a strategic priority along with access and success. That's important. So you really have to talk about it as an important responsibility uh, at the institutional level. What has been, so we've been able to reallocate resources uh, to focus attention on that. And I tell everybody that equity and, and, in, in, and um, inclusion is, um, is the responsibility of all of us. What has been so important uh, during COVID-19 is the support that we've received from the federal government. Uh, through the CARES Act, uh, my hope is that we can get funding from the HEROES Act. And even though that money does not come directly to institutions, it's still a way to get money to states that ultimately might get to institutions. And in, in the HEROES Act, even though the money is earmarked specifically for uh, municipalities and state needs, there's an opportunity also to provide uh, support for uh, institutions as well. Uh, I think um, uh, the uh, Secretary of Education announced last week another funding stream uh, that will benefit institutions. And I just received word today that we're getting additional funds uh, from the CARES Act. So the federal intervention has been significant. Now, does it take care of all of the shortfall? Absolutely not. We mentioned we owe, we mentioned the Jobs Act, we mentioned all of those things out there. I'm concerned about the political issues that are going on in DC that might prevent other funding coming to uh, institutions, but the federal government has been the greatest source of revenue support, uh, particularly uh, during COVID. I think, I think that states are gonna have to reframe how they support higher education and really think about it as an important uh, priority uh, uh, as opposed to something that uh, is expendable in the event we have a financial crisis because that is the first to be cut along with other important services uh, to individuals. So um, I do believe that the states are gonna have to really, really look uh, closely at that revenue stream and institutions, unfortunately, will have to become more entrepreneurial I do believe that community colleges have an advantage in that regard because of the short-term training and the partnerships that they can actually create with business and industry, local economic development entities, and most notably the workforce development system. So we've got to be a little bit more entrepreneurial now to support those revenue streams that we already have in place. Thanks, Alex. Uh Time is running short. Catherine or Zord, do either of you have a 30 second answer? Anything you want to add there or? Sure, I'll add that uh, the Senate Dems introduced uh, a new bill yesterday that also gets at child care education and higher ed funding that is worth taking a look at that proposal. Um, and also let's not forget about need-based aid and how we might be able to increase need-based aid so that those who need it most can uh, get the resources that they need in order to matriculate. And short-term pay, please, short-term yeah. pay, most definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. I would just sure. add, you know, as a state um, advocating for as much federal resources as you can for your state and then for the higher education sector and also working with students to help them understand, you know, the importance of completing a FAFSA, for example. So we put a lot of energy there. So thank you so much for the conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Now, gr greatly appreciated to all of our panelists for this thought provoking discussion. Um, a link to the recording will be emailed, uh, will also be posted on the ESG website. We're planning another series of webinars and information on these will soon be out. 
and please hold July the 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern for navigating enrollment shifts. Thanks to all of you for your participation uh, today. Have a great July the 4th weekend, and we will see you soon. Thanks so much. All right, guys. Thank you. Take care. All right.